about it, um, jQuery Conf and a little modified as well, but it's sort of uh, what's going on with the jQuery project, uh, not just code, but sort of a big picture view of the entire project. And I guess it's fitting for me to be first. So yeah, like I said, it's going to be a State of the Union talk as opposed to a code talk, although there's some code at the end. So the first question is, how is jQuery doing in terms of usage? So the fact that everyone's here is a pretty good uh, indicator of that. But here's a better indicator of that. Um, this is stats from Built With. And you can quibble about it, but um, according to this, 40% of the top 10,000 sites use jQuery, 30% uh, of the top 100,000, and 20% of the top million. So that means that in the top million sites, one out of every five uses jQuery. I can tell you I started with jQuery uh, in 2005, and we were lucky if we had one of the top million sites. Um, so I'm at, it's really exciting for me to see this happen. And I think it speaks a lot to a lot of the things that John has wanted, has tried to do over the past several years. And this is something that if you have any kind of open source project or trying to build a community, something that John did that I think really helped here is he refused the idea of we're going to make a jQuery 2.0 that breaks backwards compatibility. So uh, pretty much every single, there are some minor backwards compatibility breakages as in any open source project. But John's, John feels strongly that there's one jQuery, uh, one build of jQuery, one uh, version of jQuery essentially with continual improvements. And I think that says a lot for the success of this project. It basically means that if you pick up a jQuery 1.2 project today, chances are it'll mostly work with jQuery 1.4. Um, obviously, plugins, etc. cetera, but um, the core of jQuery has been really stable, much more stable than any other, any other project that I've worked with, and that's really cool. Uh, this is the jQuery site. So in all of 2009, we had 23 million hits. And uh, in 2010, up until now, we have had, this is visitors, sorry, 116 million visitors. So that's a big improvement over the past year. And this also it, um, coincides with a lot of adoption from bigger companies like uh, Microsoft, which we announced around this time last year, starting to really dig in with jQuery. Um, and some other really big companies, Nokia, uh, Adobe re recently announced. So getting really big companies to really uh, get involved, treat jQuery like, like what it is, which is the standard library of the web, has really helped. And in general, there really isn't anybody that competes here in terms of raw usage. And this is uh, Google Trends. I'm a Rails guy, so I put that in there. Um, but you can see jQuery is going up. This is Google Insights for Search if you just look at the programming category. So uh, jQuery is continually going up, and pretty much everything else is stagnant or going down. And this is if you look at growth. So um, Ajax and Rails are sort of stagnant, to slightly underperforming the programming category as a whole, and jQuery is just shooting up. Um, so that's, for me, I think, really cool in general, but it also goes to show that if you're a jQuery person, uh, if you're thinking about using jQuery, you're looking to invest heavily in jQuery, there really isn't anybody else that even comes close. Um, I remember like two years ago when we crossed the word prototype. So for a long time, jQuery was sort of, grow you can see sort of here growing up, right? Um, and for a long time, we, it's hard to compare, right? You can Google, uh, do a Google trend for prototype, you can do a Google trend for, MooTools is pretty good, uh, jQuery is pretty good, but you have a lot of these words. Um, YUI, that's a name in Japan, UI, right? So um, it's very hard to do fair searches. Then you start doing stuff like JavaScript, except who searches for jQuery JavaScript? A lot of people might search for YUI JavaScript. So it gets very hard to do these things. So we just sort of said the word prototype, that's a really big word. Um, at some point, we'll cross that, or we hoped, and then we'll know we just won. Um, and that happened about two years ago already. So that, that we beat, you know, making prototypes of whatever is in the prototype JavaScript library and the prototype word in JavaScript, right? So that's, that was sort of the biggest number. And that means that no matter how you slice it, no matter how you look at maybe you did the search wrong, um, jQuery won. That's cool. Um, and we've just continued growing heavily since then. One of the things that happened as a result of the jQuery project growing up is that we have, we got a lot of donations from big companies like Microsoft and Adobe um, and other companies. And we also got a lot more contribution. So it became time to organize jQuery as a project. For the first three or so years of jQuery, uh, was sort of whoever was around answering questions on the list, doing whatever work. Uh, we all ran the website ourselves, you know, all five of us or whatever. And some, at some point we started to transition more into uh, how do we make ourselves like a project, sort of like the Apache Foundation, um, although we didn't start out nearly as formal as that. But we wanted to say we have a project. And um, around this time last year, we announced the jQuery Project website, which 
is sort of, we're not our own nonprofit um, yet, maybe, uh, but we sort of treat the jQuery project as though it was its own entity and has its own website and all that. So uh, what we've been doing recently is we've been really tightening up our governance, and a lot of the reason for that is that we started to get both more big players involved, like Microsoft, who really care a lot about the legal status of the code, um, but also a lot of contributions, both from big companies and also from little guys. So um, if you look at all the money that we have in our bank account, a lot of it comes from individual contributors or individual donors. So we really wanted to tighten up how it is that we were spending money. For the longest time, we didn't have that much money. And John would sort of spend money on Rimu hosting every month and say, call it a day. You know, that's, that's the $1,000 that we have donated this quarter. But that changed really dramatically recently or in, a, in the past couple of years. So we've been focusing a lot on governance. Um, one thing, if you're interested in jQuery governance, is all votes of the jQuery team, which right now is 19 members, um, are on this Google, uh, public Google groups. So jQuery team public, sorry, Microsoft. Um, but uh, you can see all the votes and they're for basically any time where we want to make any changes to the membership, any changes to governance, or any allocation of money um, have to be on here. And we've been doing that for a while. And we have, for the longest time, we had a process of a simple motion, second, et cetera. Um, we've, I'll talk in a second, we've tightened that up a little bit more, but if you want to just see sort of anything that has to do with your donations or other people's donations to the project and how we're uh, allocating that, that includes money that maybe Microsoft donates to the project specifically for some purpose. So Microsoft may say, here's some tens of thousands of dollars to specifically to fund a, a developer working on some project. Um, we still allocate that through the normal voting process. Um, we recently had a, a meeting where we'd sort of discuss what the jQuery governance rules were going to be just because we vote on everything wasn't uh, really cutting it. We needed something more specific than that. So we created a jQuery governance rules and that was sort of the last vote under the old rules which were we vote and you need a majority. Um, and the new rules sort of have the same set of ideas but are more specific. So if you want to see what those are, those, there's a public vote uh, to approve those. Really the main Ideas are every time we spend money, it requires a vote. A majority of everybody is required to approve. So we didn't mess with things like quorum and that sort of thing. It's just we have 19 members. You need a majority of those people to approve anything. Um, so far, we've spent money on things like team meetings, conferences, audiovisual equipment. Um, we spent some money on paying Scott Gonzalez halftime as a developer. So that was probably our biggest expense out of um, money that was not sort of given to us by a big company for a specific purpose. Um, but we're also looking to improve our infrastructure and uh, maybe hire more developers like Scott. And also we've spent a big chunk of money on both the design and development of jQuery Mobile. So we're sort of uh, taking a look at the money that we've gotten from people like you and seeing how, do we, how we help people like you. So uh, we spent some money on things like team meetings, conferences um, so far have always broken even or, um, or raised money for the project. Um, team meetings cost a little bit, although we always piggyback them on conferences, so we're sort of attending anyway. Um, and we're looking at more things like documentation, infrastructure, uh, hiring people to accelerate, further accelerate the pro process of jQuery and for more work on jQuery mobile. Sorry, I just, those slides were flipped. Um, another thing that we, uh, that was happened as a result of the governance is we created an uh, ex official executive board that's also voted on in the public meeting. And it's those people, two of us are here, so that's cool. Um, but so that's uh, seven people who are sort of more responsible for the day-to-day -day operations than the 19 people who have votes. The idea, um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the idea basically was we want to make sure that the people who have historically been responsible for voting, sort of the bigger group of jQuery contributors, are still responsible, and we just allocate sort of... Um, we make it so that smaller groups are able to bring things forward, so that, smaller, so that everybody doesn't have to think about things all the time. And that really gives us a good balance between a small group of people that are thinking about, that are involved with jQuery all the time, and a bigger group that are responsible for the interests of jQuery as a result of having spent some time and effort on jQuery. Um, one thing that the community pushed us pretty hard on, and I'm happy that we went, got through this, was uh, conflicts of interest. So we have, there's um, some big companies now that are contributing to jQuery and therefore have voting members on the jQuery team. And uh, there were a couple. There was uh, one company in particular that was that had started to accumulate a lot of people. And we, we don't have any. I mean, there are people on the core team, so we, we like them and think they're they're great. And Jonathan actually is one of the people who's here, so 
no harm. But we were worried about sort of the future. So um, we don't want a, one big company to sort of buy onto the jQuery project and then take it over. So we created a series of rules that make it hard for people to just sort of take over and gain control of the project. Um, the most interesting to me was that one com one people associated with one company can't vote, uh, can't have more than a quarter of the votes uh, period. So even if a company has three quarters of all the people, only a quarter of their votes count and then the other people still have to, would still have to vote. So it's a little complicated the way it works, but the basic idea is that one company can't have more than a quarter of the votes on the team. Um, that doesn't mean you can't, you can have as many people as you want, but you, they, the votes don't count. Um, and then we also had sort of more traditional, if you're associated with a company, you can't vote to allocate money to that company. Um, this was something that people were uh, asked a lot about. And there's just some other areas that are in the governance rules, which are um, voting in advance for expenditures. So we had some cases where we retroactively voted to approve expenditures, and that was getting people up in hackles because it's hard to not vote yes on a $10,000 expense that someone's expecting money on. Um, just how votes should work in general. So this isn't very different from what we were doing all along. How people get added and removed from membership, and then mo most importantly, creation of subteams, which leads into a path to contribution. So here's sort of uh, where you might be interested. A lot of people are interested in contributing to jQuery uh, in, in particular, and we were looking at how to get a path to contribution that was more, that was better than uh, just sort of the open source, the normal open source. Come in and contribute. Write some code write some documentation, and maybe there's a path. And uh, that's sort of what we've been doing all along, like pretty much everyone else. One solution to this problem that we've done historically better than I think most open source projects is that we've created subteams. So you know, there's all these subteams. Um, and one thing that I think jQuery does really great is that there's a lot of people on, this, on these subteams who aren't necessarily writing code. I think there's only three or four people on the jQuery core team out of 19 that write code every day uh, for jQuery. But there's a lot of other people who are involved in doing other things like front end design, infrastructure, jQuery UI, which I guess is code, um, doing documentation, do, running events, doing developer relations. And I think that gave jQuery a really strong team in general. So there's people whose job it is to do developer relations. It's not going to, I don't have to, or John doesn't have to stop writing code to go respond to some blog post that somebody wrote. There are people whose job it is. And that led us to really good websites, so the jQuery podcast, and a whole bunch of other great things that. Uh, let us scale in terms of infrastructure. I think that's sort of a unappreciated thing about jQuery is that our site has been up even though we sort of had this 45 degree in increase in traffic forever. Um, it's not it's not perfect, but I think given the that amount of traffic and given the volunteer uh, nature of our project, it's pretty amazing how much the jQuery site just has been up for that long. So we have all these people doing these things, and. Um, what this means is that you might, be in, you might be interested in developer relations. You might be interested in doing better documentation. You might be interested in helping with events, design, infrastructure, um, or development. And it should be easy for you to get involved in those things. Um, of those things, really the only easy way to get in are documentation and development. Right? So if you want to get involved in infrastructure, if you want to get involved in doing the website design, it's not obvious. So one thing that we're going to be doing moving forward is making it more clear how to get involved in each subteam. So the governance policy actually creates all these subteams. Um, and we are now going to, on the website, tell you, here are the people in charge of infrastructure. And if you're interested in that, here, is the, here are the things that we're waiting on. Um, the normal queue is this amount of time. Here are the types of tasks that, are, that people are waiting on doing. Uh, this is very obvious for stuff like ticketing, but could even make sense for events. You know, we're waiting. This, this sort of thing needs to happen. We're waiting on someone. If you want to come help, here's how you would do that. Uh, we, uh, we've reduced the amount of time that it takes us to go from tickets to no tickets or um, unplanned event to planned event by this amount of time. So we'll start really looking at that sort of thing and giving you a clear idea of how to contribute. Um, and also, we're going to be making it so that the people who are in charge of subteams are also responsible for either mentoring or being responsible for mentors, mentoring new people. So whoever's in charge of events or documentation or development or developer relations, if you want to get involved, you won't sort of be jumping into the, the, the pool. You'll be having somebody who you're supposed to ask as you get involved. So uh, I think that's really cool. I think that's something that both became formalized through the governance plan, but also is something that we really felt was needed when we, looked, uh, when we met a couple months ago to discuss the project was how to get more people in. I think something that it's, it's good that we have 19 people in all these areas that are really active in the jQuery team, but 
given the size of the jQuery project, it needs to be bigger than that. So we're really looking for people to step up, but we know that we need to give you a way to step up. So I think that's going to be good. Um, in terms of legal, probably the biggest thing is that we are working on a CLA or a contributor licensing agreement. Um, the reason for that, again, is that a lot of new in contributors to the project are really worried about the legal status of the code. And um, what that means is that all the contributors historically and then all the contributors going forward need to officially give the code up to some entity. So we finally finished it. We finally finished the contributor license agreement. I think Microsoft was the first people to sign it. Um, pretty All the jQuery team members have agreed to sign it, which means all the past contributors to the jQuery project will sign over the code. Um, and the important thing is that the jQuery project will then own the code. So um, right now, jQuery is a subsidiary of the Software Freedom no of the Software Conservancy, Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, that the jQuery project, as part of that, will own the code. And one really great thing about the way we did the CLA is that we the jQuery project or the Software Freedom Conservancy are not allowed to transfer the code unless somebody else agrees to the same thing. So that means that in perpetuity, the jQuery project will always be open source because there is no way, um, and you can say like it's MIT, anybody can fork it, but that's sort of not really, that's not really the way it works. If we decided as a project that it's closed source from here on out, some, it would have to spring out of whole cloth another project to keep the open source project going, sort of like what happened with MySQL. Um, and what this does is it makes sure that everyone contributing is sure that the jQuery code that they contributed to the main line is always going to be open source under the same license or some open license. Um, and that's a fact. That's period. So um, I think that's great. I think more projects could do this. I think people don't realize that they're giving up their code to an entity like the jQuery project. And the jQuery project can then decide, we're going to start a company. And now it's proprietary. And there's really nothing that you can do about it except fork it and start another thing. And I think a lot of people would feel better if they knew that that was impossible. So I think that's great for jQuery. And I'm, I'm happy to have advocated for that as part of the CLA process in general. So in general, more projects have adopted jQuery. Um, so Adobe recently started really pushing on adoption. Uh, there's this blog post by O'Reilly, Adobe Heart jQuery. And there's a bunch of stuff here that you can look at. But basically, Adobe has really put their, um, just like Microsoft, has really put their energy into jQuery. And Dreamweaver, Adobe uh, Edge, and the, the video thing all use jQuery. And I think that really just goes to show that jQuery is the standard library for the web. So that's, that's sort of my story, and I'm sticking to it. I think anybody who, who tries to build their own DOM uh, abstraction at this point, who feels like that's a useful thing to do, you should stop doing it. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't need other frameworks, other frameworks built on top, because DOM is not the end of the story, right? There's obviously that's what I do every day now is work on Sprout Core, which is uh, not, which is built on jQuery but not jQuery, right? And I think there's more official plugins that are coming out that I'll talk about soon. But as a DOM abstraction, the browser's library is not good. jQuery is good. It has the vast majority of the websites that are doing anything using it. And so if you want to contribute to the betterment of the DOM abstraction on the web, you should be using jQuery. You could, of course, do your own thing, but honestly, you're always going to be behind. At this point, jQuery has so much momentum behind it, it has so much energy behind things that you would never have thought of. Um, I recently wrote a blog post about this in which I basically said, there's a lot of details like jQuery will cache a DOM fragment if you do dollar something and then append it to the page. So if you do that a bunch of times in a loop, or just because it's in a handler, you'll, you'll get the same DOM fragment. It'll be much faster. So A, you probably wouldn't have thought to do that. And B, most people probably don't know what a, what a document fragment is. Um, and that's some things that jQuery has built up and really aren't. If you look at other libraries, some percentage of the improvements that jQuery has are in these libraries, but not all of them. And jQuery is always getting better. So if you want to contribute, if you have improvements to the DOM, if you say, hey, jQuery is slow here, and it could be better with x. You should just contribute it to jQuery. You should not make your own thing and say, look, I have something faster than jQuery. Because all jQuery needs to do at that point is take that library and library's improvement and put it into jQuery, which has a million other improvements. So yeah, I think, I think that this is obvious. And I think big companies are starting to notice it as well. Um, here's a tweet about John Resig being at Adobe Max giving a keynote, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I'm just mentioning this because I do this every day now, Sprout Core. 
Um, Sproutcore, about six months ago, decided uh, it had its own fork of jQuery called Core Query, which was supposedly faster. And at some point, they realized that it's not faster anymore, and jQuery is just going to always be ahead. Um, and so Sproutcore switched over to jQuery as the DOM layer. So anything that's to do with DOM uses jQuery now. Um, and I also, uh, this blog post is me saying that I'm personally going to be working on plugins and other things because, like, like I said, there are some things that we have um, around 3D acceleration, um, animation, stuff like that, that are better than what jQuery has, but we, those should just be contributed back to jQuery. They shouldn't need to be a separate library. We shouldn't say, we don't want to use jQuery's animation library because it's slow. We should just make jQuery's animation library fast. And this is sort of my quote again. Uh, jQuery has become a standard library of the web. It belongs to the web. It doesn't belong to any one company, any one person. It belongs to the web, and it's a, the place that we go to work on the future, in my view. So that's all for sort of the big picture of jQuery. Here is code, some code. So, or code areas. <laughs> um, so actually, there's not that much code here, but there's, <laughs> there's about the code, at least. This is not my usual at all. Um, so jQuery 1.4.3 we released, um, I guess, a couple months ago uh, at jQuery Conf. And jQuery 1.4.3 is already being superseded by jQuery 1.4.4, which we uh, put into beta, I think, a few days ago. Um, but jQuery 1.4.3 was really the first mobile version of jQuery that, uh, not, that it had, not that it shipped with jQuery mobile, but that we spent a lot of time looking at a lot of devices and improving compatibility with mobile. So. Uh, before that, it might have worked on BlackBerry, but that would have been an accident. Um, and now it works on BlackBerry because we spent some time making it work on BlackBerry. So another thing, uh, another big thing is that we went through and uh, used JSLint. There's one thing I think we changed about JSLint. Uh, Crockford wants you to do, if you want to say that something is null or undefined, he wants you to say foo double equals null, foo triple equals null, or foo triple equals undefined, and we always just do double equals null. Um, it's actually always correct, and it's faster. Um, so I think with the exception of double equals null, the triple equals rule is good. But I think uh, we think it's overkill. So we have a special JSLint that lets us do double equals null. But otherwise, all the other JSLint rules we follow. And that means that we can enforce the style. So one thing that becomes difficult when you get into a project the size of jQuery, which is still pretty small as JavaScript libraries go, but there's a lot of code in there, is to make sure that new code actually follows the style. So we have a style guide, which is a lot of JSLint um, and some extra stuff. And we want to make sure that, it, that we notice if people are breaking the style guide. And now we have a task that we can use, makelint, that's part of the build process that guarantees that. Again, it has that one tweak to, to JSLint, but otherwise, um, it basically enforces our style guide. And this is something I would say there isn't really a good reason to not uh, comply with JSLint. And what might make sense is to add some stuff to it. But I think that if you have a big jo JavaScript project, style becomes really important. Um, something that we do in Sproutcore, uh, which is a much bigger library, is we use double quotes for English and single quotes for what would be identifier. So if you have like a property name, and you put it inside of brackets, it's always single quotes. And that's just to make it easier to search the project for things. Um, so I think uh, that's something I hadn't thought about before I joined Sproutcore, but it's something that things like that I think make a big difference when you're maintaining a big JavaScript uh, code base. And I think most people actually have code bases that are bigger than jQuery. Like their own code is bigger than jQuery's. So I think uh, you can sort of take jQuery's lead if, the, if all you do is make JavaScript lint part of your build process. I think that that's great. Um, another thing that we did in, Java, in jQuery 1.4.3 is sort of the last, the last piece of modularity that we've been working towards for a bunch of releases. Um, every piece of jQuery is able to be loaded on its own. Um, that was always theoretically true, but never guaranteed. And I think uh, there were reasons why it wasn't true. Now every part of jQuery could be loaded individually, so you don't have to load the whole thing. That could be helpful with a theoretical script loader. Um, it's, un, it's not so obvious. Again, I think John feels really strongly about the single build of jQuery, and I agree with him, um, that you really want one jQuery, not 15 jQueries, and people are going out to Stack Overflow asking questions, and it's like, oh, you forgot to include the events module, right? I think there's a lot of utility to everyone using the same thing, and everyone's upgrading and locked up with each other. Um, so I, but this could be useful for some cases with really advanced users. Um, it's definitely useful for, or it, it might be useful for Sproutcore. We're still investigating. But the ability to, to know that jQuery supports a mode where, for instance, animations are not part of the build. Um, right now, you could do that, but it's not really supported. 
um, as a, or I guess as a 142, as a 143, it's an officially supported thing if you would like to do that. A really big win for this for us, and I think probably the reason why we did this is that it lets us have the test suite for like Core JS run with Core JS, or the test suite for things run with just the script tags, like a bunch of script tags, without having to load in, without having to do a build step to combine them. Before we needed a build step because you couldn't run effects.js on its own. It had to be combined in order to run it all. And now we're able to just have a bunch of script tags that point at the source files, and we can run the test suite after changing them, which for people who are working on uh, jQuery core is actually a pretty big deal. Another big thing we did in jQuery uh, 143 is rewrite CSS. So CSS uh, was completely rewritten mainly for modularity, um, or sorry, for extensibility. The reason why we, what I mean by extensibility is that if you make a CSS change, there are some cases where you want it to do something else for to use new browsers. Um, so I'm going to say in a second, the jQuery Rotate plugin uses this now to uh, allow you to make a modification to CSS and then have it do something. And uh, we really wanted to make this possible to let you hook into the CSS system. Um, and there were plugins that were asking it. Um, also a little bit of performance. So um, a lot of times when you do an extensibility enhancement on a code base, performance suffers, and we actually did the reverse. We got better performance out of this rewrite, so um, that's great. I think, in general, uh, it's something to ask if people do an extensibility enhancement of existing code, and I think it's, it's o in, my, in my experience, it's always possible to improve performance when you rewrite code, and if somebody does an extensibility improvement and doesn't get better performance, it basically means they did sort of a surface layer extensibility, and they didn't really do a, a big, um, refresh. And this, if, if you're doing a big sensibility enhancement, it's always a good opportunity to go back and look at the code. So like I said, the jQuery, uh, the jQuery rotate plugin uses this functionality. And essentially what it lets you do is it lets you create a, a virtual CSS property. Um, for a long time, there's been the idea of virtual events. And that's used for stuff like mouse enter and mouse leave for non-Internet Explorer browsers. And now you can create virtual CSS properties as well. Um, this is just the beginning of a, a pretty long block, actually. But you can say, uh, when uh, the rotate CSS gets set, here's some code to run. And you can also unset. So um, that lets you control things. And this, this will use CSS transformations if it can, or it will use uh, fallback animations. And like I said, the performance is slightly improved. Um, again, this wasn't really a performance rewrite, but it was an effort to improve the performance. It was an effort to do extensibility without losing performance, and that's a win here. And that brings me to, in general, uh, jQuery 143 put some time into using native performance where possible. So all the new browsers, um, including newer Internet Explorers, have improved uh, performance around things like doing selections, which are extremely common. Um, selections, the newest browsers have better support for filtering. And, so, and these are really common behaviors, especially if you use live. Filtering is a very common thing. You need to quickly say, does this element match another element? And these are all, um, the matches selector is actually something that John lobbied getting into all these browsers and is now in the browsers and they're working on a spec for. But a lot of the other things like query selector all have just sort of been there for a while. And so jQuery went in and basically updated the sizzle engine to use these, um, to use these functionality were available. And here you'll see a much bigger improvement. So um, for, the, for something like Chrome where the JavaScript engine is really fast, we see a modest improvement for uh, Firefox, you see a much bigger improvement, and uh, similarly for IE9. So um, what's interesting is that Chrome's JavaScript engine is so fast that doing sort of manual traversal here, uh, sort of manual filtering, checking to see if the, thing, if the element matches some selector, isn't that much slower. But there's other browsers with much slower JavaScript engines where it matters a lot more. Um, Safari 5 is surprisingly a large improvement. Um, find is something that pretty much all the browsers gain a lot in. Find is basically just using Query Selector All if it's available. Um, Query Selector All, people, people may not know this, is available as of IE8. So um, everything except IE6 and 7 get a really big improvement in Find in jQuery 143. And again, this is because jQuery Selector Engine essentially is built into all the new browsers. So we were able to just say, if you have the Selector Engine, use it. There's a couple of weird quirks. Um, the built-in browser Selector Engine doesn't scope subsequent query selector alls to the element um, in weird ways. So there's a hack that people use, which is basically to create a, an ID on the element and then search by that ID, um, which just means that you can't just say, essentially, jQuery.find equals 
query selector all, but it's close enough that you get a really big speed improvement. And then closest, you get sort of this massive speed improvement. Um, and that's because match the selector is now built in. So essentially, the, what closest does is it goes up the tree and it looks for uh, it looks for elements that match a selector. So you're going up the tree. So you usually have like three or four things that you're checking to see if they match a certain selector. And this, we're able to just use match a selector, which is an extremely fast path in all new browsers. Uh, IE8 doesn't have that, but IE9 has it, Safari 5, Chrome, and uh, Firefox, as old as Firefox 3.6 has it. So um, that means that this, this is actually really important for event delegation. So Because in event delegation, what you do is you register a single event on the document, and then you check to see for every event whether or not it matches, a whether the element that triggered it matches a selector. So you have to do this a large amount of times if you use .live, and this is a really nice improvement. It really makes pages that use the event delegation much faster. So that's sort of what 143 did. Um, I think I mentioned this, but um, there's also been a, just a lot of bug fixes in general. So something that you, that is sort of invisible to you as a user is the amount of bug fixes that go into every single release of jQuery, like literally hundreds of bug fixes. And that's a function of the large community. So we get a lot of weird edge cases that most other JavaScript libraries don't ever see because of the fact that we have people using jQuery in a lot of weird cases. And that's something that, in general, is a really big deal for open source projects. You want people to be using your stuff in really obscure cases, and you want to deal with the fact that they're submitting bugs, right? The fact that they're not writing code isn't that big a deal. You want people to submit you want people to stress out your code. So that's sort of, that's 143. Another thing that we've been doing a lot recently is official plugins, and that's mostly due to our sponsors here. Um, Microsoft has been putting a lot of their energy into official plugins. So I'll talk about two of them right now. One of them is jQuery Data Link. And this is a simple version of what a lot of people have done on object bindings, but it's pretty nice jQuery syntax. Um, it lets you link uh, forms live with J JavaScript objects, and again, it was developed with Microsoft. So it works something like this. Uh, you can make a user object and any JavaScript object. And then you say, link this, uh, this form to the user object. And then you say basically what the two directions are. Um, so then if you modify the user's first name, it will modify the form element with the ID of first name, <coughs> class name, last name. And you can, there's more com complex stuff you can do. You can specify how to convert. Um, so here, what happens is that when sales rank gets converted from uh, the reverse, uh, you go and you modify the target so you get all this information. This is definitely an advanced example. Um, but basically what this means is that you can, sp you can have a live JavaScript object and a live form and have them connect to each other. And this actually uh, really nice thing that I didn't talk about in 143 is that we improved dot .data a lot for regular JavaScript objects and that was really led by wanting to improve jQuery data link. Um, I, I think that jQuery data link could be better, and I think um, it could be more robust. So I think a single level of linking is really cool, and you run into obvious places where you want to do more than a single level of linking pretty quickly. And I think that's something that my the Microsoft team is thinking about. So, um, but I think in general this is cool. I think it lets you break apart sort of the data model of your page from the DOM of your page, which as you get into bigger applications starts to become really nice. Um, so I would check that out. Uh, the second thing. Second official plugin that we that I want to talk about is the jQuery template plugin, and this is also developed with Microsoft. Um, it's again pretty straightforward. I think the thing I like about a lot of these plugins is that they really feel like jQuery. They feel like the API of jQuery and not sort of some other thing, which is cool. So here we have uh, a data object. So it has um, first name Yehuda, and then you can take an object and there's a new method temple. Um, you say the data, and then you say append to ul, and then um, here, here, for example, is a script tag. So you can, sorry, I should step back. So you can actually get your template from a script tag. So this is a trick that John figured out like four years ago or something like that. I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think he was the first, but um, John figured this out a long time ago. And basically what, what happens is you have a script tag with a type that's not a JavaScript type. The browser will still see it as a string, so you can still get the HTML of that string but it doesn't actually parse it as a script. So you can put arbitrary globs in there, anything that doesn't contain a slash script inside of it. So you can't nest other scripts because that really confuses the browser. But um, you can put any HTML in there. And what this lets us do is it lets us say um, dollar pound item dot temple lets us grab it from the script and then we can append it you all. Um, there's some other cool stuff. Um, you can go and ask for a nodes temple item. Um, so basically we store off the 
object that went into the template onto the UL, and then you can go back and get the data out. You can imagine doing data linking um, and templating together, which would be pretty nice. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if someone's working on that or not, but it's pretty easy to see how that could work. And really, the big picture is that with Microsoft's involvement, we've really started to look at um, how to make plugins focus on full apps. And I think this is something that it's really good that the jQuery project itself, the jQuery core, is not going this direction. I think it's good for the jQuery project, the bigger you know, jQuery.org project, to be looking at how to do this. But I think it's good that the jQuery core doesn't. That jQuery core is focused on being a really awesome DOM abstraction and letting these other plugins that are being funded by big players drive what functionality we need in the core. And that's kept the core reasonably small but really powerful and moving forward as more features are needed, which is great. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is jQuery Mobile. So uh, the big picture of jQuery Mobile is that there are a lot more platforms than WebKit. Um, obviously, we know that. So, um, or the Microsoft people here know that. So there's a lot of platforms. A lot of people are focusing on WebKit. Um, here's an example. Um, this is something that didn't exist in jQuery before we started doing this work. So there's some BlackBerry bug that makes something not work. So there's basically all these platforms that people aren't focusing energy on. And that means that with the exception of jQuery as of 1.4.3, there hasn't really been any energy whatsoever of the type that, that was placed into things like jQuery five years ago to make browsers work, to make libraries work well in all browsers, right? So we had this huge effort with jQuery, prototype, YUI, and all this stuff to make these libraries work really well across all the browsers that everyone was using, which was smallish at the time. And that's held for, for desktop browsers, but it has not held for mobile browsers. And there's a lot of browsers that are really popular, um, BlackBerry, Opera, Windows Mobile. And, and you might say these browsers are close enough that they'll probably work, and, I, and that's mostly true, but it's not true enough that if you try to use a browser that doesn't care, a, a library that doesn't care about this on those browsers, that it will actually work. Um, there's a lot of little gotchas, a lot of you know, DOM content loaded event fires at the wrong time. Um, weirdness and you really just have to focus on it. And something that we've done really extensively is analyze the, browser, the mobile browser market in the same way that YUI analyzed the desktop browser market and figured out what the combination of browsers that have a lot of market share and actually have browsers that work really at all are. So A is basically big market share, a lot of people use it. Uh, so big, big market share, reasonably modern browser. B is either big market share and kind of old browser or small market share but re relatively up-to-date browser, and then C and F are sort of the, uh, you probably wouldn't want to put an HTML page on this browser. But those are pretty old. Like if you look at, um, if you look at Windows Mobile, you can see that, with the ex that Windows Mobile 6.6, which is the last generation of Windows Mobile, is graded as B, um, and only the generation before that is graded as F. And there's only two Fs. There's old BlackBerry and old Windows Mobile. Um, I'm almost done here. So, uh, so we've, I think this energy in figuring out what these browsers are, getting a hold of phones, this is something that jQuery is really doing. It's actually kind of embarrassing, I think, for the guys who aren't. I don't know why other libraries that exist aren't really putting in the energy here. And I, I think it really um, speaks a lot to whether or not you can, you can think about using these, these libraries if you just want things to work. If, even if you're building a non-really rich site, if you're just building a site and you want click events to work, you just don't know um, that a lot of libraries work and will have click events work. Maybe the ready event doesn't work on some of these browsers. So um, I think this is cool. This is something that's great. And th that was sort of phase one here was to go through and fix all the bugs in all the major browsers, which are basically A and B graded browsers. And we've done that via um, test swarm, which basically lets us see all the bugs and all of our test suites across all the browsers. And we've done that with mobile devices. We've added mobile devices into the mix now. So we can see that jQuery is green everywhere. And again, I think this is uh, an endeavor that, is, that nobody else comes even close to in terms of the amount of energy that goes into making sure that, our, that jQuery actually works everywhere, not just pretends to work everywhere or theoretically should work everywhere. Uh, and phase one is really continuing effort. Phase one, uh, we haven't fixed every mobile browser bug, just like we haven't fixed every desktop browser bug. But we feel pretty confident that jQuery works in all the browsers that we say it works in now, um, which again is not is something that seems theoretically true, but it's not in practice usually true. Um, the second phase is something that I haven't been as involved in, but it's uh, making a framework for building mobile websites and. The idea here is that now that we have an underlying code base that works everywhere, let's actually build something that is uh, 
progressively enhanced that works everywhere. So um, it's one thing to build something that works on WebKit, and there's definitely use cases for that, but it's sort of not great if you're building just a regular website uh, to, to abandon 70% of the market to peop of people who don't have WebKit phones, or more than that, 77 or something. So uh, the idea here is that if you want to build a website, you want it to be, you want it to have you know, transitions that are nice, you want it to feel sort of like a, a modern mobile, uh, modern mobile website, but at the same time you want it to work on relatively old browsers on the phone, that that's something that you can do. Um, and that I think is, uh, John's been focusing a lot of energy on it. The jQuery team has put a lot of money into the design of this and uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think if you're building sort of, if you want to just get something up, up and running really quickly and have it work everywhere, there's nothing that even comes close to this level of polish, which is great. Um, so jQuery mobile, we announced the alpha uh, at jQuerySoft, and I th we're going to be releasing more alphas and more betas, and finally a final in the upcoming months. So keep an eye on that. Um, like I said, it has both widgets and layout. So um, it has a bunch of widgets, but it also does layout control. Here's I'll give you a couple examples. So here's uh, here's some of the uh, sort of a kitchen sink widget. Here's a choice thing, and here's scrolling thing. Um, I think John, John's made some design decisions to make it work everywhere, which you can definitely play with it and, and see what those are. But I think it's great that we have something that is sort of at the conceptual level of something like Sencha Touch, but works in so many browsers. I think um, I think if you're going to go, if you're going to build something that is that you want to make sense, if you, you know you're going to build an HTML page and have it work everywhere, it doesn't really make sense to build something like that and only target it at WebKit. I think. I don't know if I should say this since I don't, this doesn't really represent the jQuery team. It represents myself. I think there's definitely a case for something that targets WebKit. If, you're, if you were theoretically going to build a uh, native application on the iPad and then you decide, actually, I would rather write that in HTML because I know it. I think that that makes sense sometimes to use advanced features. But if you're going to build something that's essentially a navigation thing with some, which goes back and forth and ends up in a map or, or an HTML, like a, another HTML view, I think targeting WebKit because it gives you Transitions makes no sense at all, and so and I think that's sort of what Sencha is asking you to do, um, and I don't know how much I should say more. But I, th I think people I think that area of application doesn't make sense unless you want to support a lot of browsers. Um, so jQuery 1.5, we are uh, working on that now. We're I think a couple months away from that. We are releasing 1.4.4 now and sort of moving ahead. We have a roadmap meeting pretty soon to discuss. Uh, always more bug fixes, and again, there, there, like, there's hundreds of them per release. I think there will probably be a lot. There's going to be a bunch of mobile bug fixes, um, as usual. I'm sure we'll more and more will roll in as we move forward. Um, we're going to be rewriting the adder system. So there's some systems, um, adder is one of them, that are really old and reflect some design decisions. A long time ago, um, adder and CSS were the same thing because they had some shared logic, and there's a lot in the adder system that reflects that lineage and we want to improve both the um, extensibility and performance of that system. So there's going to basically be a rewrite of that system. Um, there's also going to be a rewrite of AJAX, more for extensibility here, more so that you get an object back from AJAX that you can do stuff to. Um, if you want to stop it, it you can do that. Um, there's been some efforts recently to do that. They've always tended on the large side, so I think we're going to have to think hard about what the goals are here. But there's definitely a goal to make $.ajax return an object which does things, um, which gives you capabilities that right now are sort of in the black box of jQuery, uh, jQuery.ajax. And this is sort of one of my pet, uh, pet issues. I want to get this in because I've had about five uses for it, um, and I, there's a bunch of other plugins that want it. Basically, it would work like this. And I, I asked John if I can talk about it, and he said, I'll try to get it in, so I'm just saying this. I'm not promising that we'll get it in. The idea is that you can ask for a subclass, which basically gives you a thing that works like jQuery, but is a subclass, and then you can extend it just like regular jQuery. And then regular jQuery's will not have the subclass method. Yep. And uh, your jQuery will have subclasses. This could be useful if you want to like make a special one that, for instance, only deals with forms. Uh, it could be useful uh, at Sprout Core. We have a, a library called Buffer jQuery, which we use to buffer up changes and then uh, commit them at once. And we use, do that by sort of monkey patching 
all of jQuery and it would be easier to monkey patch all of a jQuery subclass that would feel um, more stable. Um, and there's somebody who has a, my friend actually who wrote the patch that hopefully we'll get in, um, Jared, he has a, a library called selectors.js that he wants to use to be able to extend jQuery for specific things. So he wants, he wants to be able to say like this selector area has these extensions. Uh, and I think if you think about it, there are probably use cases. John's been a little wary about it for general consumption because people could go crazy with this. Um, sort of gives you, unless you have a new namespace for things and there's something to be said for the fact that the namespace of jQuery is sort of special. Um, and it also, me, it would also be somewhat difficult to add plugins into it. I guess you could uh, rename jQuery quickly, load the plugin and then unload it or something. But it would be hard to have it work correctly. So um, I think there's a utility for it, but I, I think it would be less useful for general purpose. But I think it could be really useful for certain types of plugins. Um, what am I doing personally? And I have, I think, four slides left. Um, like I said, I started working on Sprout Core. There's a lot of stuff in Sprout Core that's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of uh, bug fixes for browser events that I now know about that I didn't know about before that could be backported, specifically stuff for iOS. So there's a lot of things that for the Sprout Core team knows about, mainly because they work for Apple and have the ability to actually go ask somebody, is this actually a bug? Um, but that are worked around in Sprout Core um, for iOS 3, iOS 4. And I'm going to be working, hopefully, to move some of that back in. Uh, again, there's also animation improvements. Um, and there's also general, in the same vein as wanting to support native stuff where it exists, there's some cases where uh, Sprout is taking a lot of advantage of hardware acceleration that I think could be really useful in jQuery core, either jQuery core or official plugins, but sort of uh, make it so that Sprout core could use jQuery plugins or jQuery as opposed to being this monolith that has all these features in it somewhere in some file somewhere. So that's been great. And I think basically what I want to do in general is make it so that HTML5 features, I think jQuery's done really a really good job at integrating stuff like query selector all and match selector into the engine. I think jQuery's done less well at integrating new HTML5 features that are visual. So um, hardware acceleration is a big deal for mobile. If you, you cannot do DOM-based animations on, on um, native, on mobile, but you can do, uh, you can use uh, hardware acceleration. So if a, a phone has hardware acceleration, which I think is everything but BlackBerry, um, you can actually get desktop-like performance on the visualizations in mobile. And I think that's a big deal and something that should just work. Um, there's some things about how those features work, like um, you can't get a callback per step like you can get in jQuery, and that definitely will break some things. But I think that letting you say in your an in, in animate, I'm willing to take, you know, to deal with the uh, downgrade of features in exchange for using hardware acceleration if it's available, essentially, is what you would say. So it would be like, in my mind, it would be something like $.animate, and there would be a new, like, hardware acceleration true option that would reduce the number of features but use hardware acceleration. And maybe that's something that goes into a plugin. But I think that that sort of thing, in, in, a lot, in the same way that the jQuery data link and jQuery template plugin feel a lot like jQuery, I don't think there's a lot of good solutions for this sort of thing that feel like jQuery, that feel good. Um, so, and I also would like to be able to have Sprout Core itself be based on a core that other people are working on. I, th I, think, I think that things like Sprout Core end up having a much smaller user base than things like jQuery. And so thing, things that are for wide distribution, things like animations, I would like to have a much larger group of people working on. Um, and I think that Sprout Core itself should be limited to the things that are only useful to the narrow group of people using that framework. So that's what I want to work on is sort of moving useful things into jQuery. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for that. It's not really a question, but there's nonprofit groups that do a lot to feed the world. There's nonprofit groups that do a lot to make the world more peaceful. Um, the amount of good that jQuery's done is in par with that. I just mean the amount that it, it benefits the world right now at this time, that it started when it did and that it does just what it, everybody's benefiting so much. So just thank you for your part, for the jQuery team's part in making it exist. Thank you. Um, I'll just make one comment on that and then I'll have to go, which is I think um, I know a lot of other J, uh, JavaScript library maintainers, and I, a lot of people 
like to give to attribute a lot of jQuery's success to marketing. I, that's a really common way to look at the space. jQuery did a, John is a really good marketing person, um, and I think that that undersells uh, undersells a lot of what is good about jQuery. I, what is good about jQuery in my mind is that John has had a really strong focus on what jQuery is for has had a really strong focus on not breaking backwards compatibility and a really strong focus on there being just one. And I think that you can attribute those things to marketing, that's fine, but we write software for human beings. And I think those things are about writing software that human beings can use, not about there was a flashy website somewhere. So um, yeah, if someone, brings, if someone says that to you, uh, I would like it if you <laughs> push back. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This is somebody. Okay, I just want to thank. That was awesome. I had no idea jQuery was thinking about all these things on the mobile space because it's sorely needed. A good JavaScript in the mobile space.